Hi, everyone, and welcome to the paramedical podcast, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the solution. So this is a round robin type of interviewing where we, uh, as paramedical or medical tattoo artists, kind of interview one another in our community talking about our industry. And I was interviewed last by Stacy Ray, and so... Uh, when it was my turn, I wanted to uh, interview Christina from Living Story Tattoo, mm -hmm. which is uh, just an amazing um, woman who comes also from the medical field. She's a registered nurse, and we have a lot in common with knowing the medical background. So I connected with her instantly on that, and her story of everything, you know, from well, I'll let her explain it. So, so welcome, Christina. Thank you for letting me interview you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'll get right to it. So our theme in this podcast is the good, the bad, the ugly. So the good, what's your favorite part of um, the work that you do? Um. So, you know, you kind of always hear the term life-changing right when you talk about nipple tattoos people people that's a recurring theme and I truly in my heart believe that this work is life-changing um because we get to see it right like right in front of our eyes we have a lady who has um here comes my dog sorry <laughs> we have a lady who is very vulnerable she's been through a lot of surgeries she's had her complete world turned upside down. She's had scares with her health, her mortality, her body image, and she's walking through your door and she's super vulnerable and she's putting all this trust in you. It's scary. Like even, um, I think for the ladies who've had other body decorative tattoos, they come in, these tattoos are just a little bit different, right? They kind of hold a different, um, like space, you know? Um, and then, at the end of the tattoo, when she gets up and she looks in the mirror, it literally is just like this transformation that you get the privilege to sit there and watch happen, right? You just watch it. And it's just, it, it's just something that I don't even know. Like, I don't even know if I have a word to describe it, but that's probably my favorite part is just to see. And then in between the two visits, right? How, how she kind of holds herself and carries herself during the first visit. She heals up, comes back a couple months later for her touch up and by that time, you know, she's, she's getting naked before the doors even shut behind her. And, you know, and she's telling me things like, gosh, you know, before I was never intimate with like my husband, I'd always have a nightgown or a teddy or something on. And now I'm like, leave the lights on, let's do it. Like, it's just those wonderful things that you get to not just see, but that they share with you. So I think that's the best part for me because it really, it is a life-changing those two little tattoos can really change so much. Yeah. Those, uh, you know, uh, four by four centimeter circles <laughs> can really yeah. make such an impact. Um, so the next question is the bad. And this is why I love your story. And I hope you talk about it a little bit. But the bad, what is the biggest problem that you see in the industry? Um, so the bad, I, you know, I feel like, and I used to contribute a lot to this problem is poorly executed tattoos on survivors. Um, you know, my story was, um, uh, I was a nurse in a plastic reconstructive office for a total of 10 years. I did nine years in an academic setting and one year in private practice. And I tattooed in that setting and I had minimal training. I watched six hours of DVDs and done by the Bow Institute, a permanent makeup um, place in Chicago, uh, New Jersey, I think. And um, I watched a nurse do one tattoo. And then literally I was turned loose with a nouveau contour machine to tattoo survivors. So see one, do one, teach one kind of mentality. Um, and the tattooing in the doctor's office is viewed as a task. It's viewed as like pulling a drain or taking out stitches or doing what or like it's, but it's not a task. It's art and it should be done by somebody that has an artistic background and they should be a trained tattooer. Um, it, it, it should not be done by people that are poorly trained. Um, and, you know, I tattoo five days a week and typically one of those days 
I'm correcting a poorly done nipple tattoo. It could have been done 15 years ago. It could have been done, you know, a year ago. Um, it just really kind of depends. Um, but for the most part, they used to always be walking through my door that had been done by somebody like myself, a nurse or a PA or a doctor or somebody in their, sur in their surgical, like reconstructive office. Um, now in my community, which I'm in Ohio, um, it seems like that is kind of shifting away a little bit. And I think it has a lot to do with the physician's mindset just in my community. Um, but now I'm seeing them come through my door that were done by permanent makeup artists who, um, you know, maybe the gal had gone to for like eyebrows and eyeliner and things like that, or known her through like a friend of a friend and, oh my gosh, you know, you also do nipples. She says, gosh, I really like my eyebrows or I like your eyebrows. I'm going to trust her and go to her. And then a couple months later, these same ladies are walking in my door asking me to correct these tattoos. And unfortunately, I've really seen an uptick in this since COVID. And I, in my opinion, I have the feeling that it's really spawned, COVID spawned a lot of the online training. You can zoom in and watch nipple tattoos be done, never actually laying your hands on a breast. You get a certificate mailed to you. You hang it on your wall. People think, oh my gosh, like you went to Harvard. <laughs> And you know what you're doing. And unfortunately, that's not the case. So that's kind of what I'm seeing in my community um, is the uptick with the poorly trained, um, you know, inadequately trained people doing that service out in the community. Um, and, and I kind of do when they tell me, like, I have this done at, at this establishment, then I do. I investigate that. I go online. I look and see, like, where did they train? What, when did they train? Did they just take their training two weeks ago? And now they're, like, advertising I'm ready to do nipple tattoos. Did they take a two day class? Um, you know, I'm really trying to figure out like to see if what the pattern is behind this emerging problem. Um, and it's not good. Yeah. So uh, that definitely kind of transitions perfectly into my next question, which is the ugly. Uh, what is the effect you are seeing from this problem? The This uptick in bad training, bad nipple tattoos, people who are just doing online only, which mm -hmm. you know how I feel about that too. Mm -hmm. is just, yeah. I wouldn't want a surgeon who learned online to do my mastectomy. So why would I want that for a tattoo artist? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, or you wouldn't let somebody cut your hair or dye your hair that did online training. Like they, like those girls, those guys, they have to do months of training and they have to pass boards and they have to be certified and they have to do like, just like we do. So it's very odd. This, um, this world that we live in with tattooing, um, the ugly that I see from it is there, uh, like we talked about before, like the positive effect of a good tattoo can really affect so many areas of your life, your intimacy, your personal relationships, your self-esteem, your body image, your, um, just your all in all outlook, your, your overall satisfaction with your entire breast reconstruction. So you can have a great breast reconstruction. It can be done beautifully by your surgeon. And in one fell swoop, somebody can come along and really just destroy all the good that you felt about that, right? Um, and so that's what I'm seeing. When these ladies are walking into my office, they're like, gosh, before I just felt like you know, they, they say these words to us, right? Like, I feel like Frankenstein, or I feel like I'm, you know, I've been butchered and I've got scars from here to kingdom come and this and that, and all that kind of messes with you. And instead of a good tattoo that can kind of detract the eyes from some of the things that she might find, you know, disturbing just in the overall picture with like scars and things, a good tattoo can kind of pull the eye away from that. A bad tattoo really just just solidifies everything that she's hated about her reconstruction or like if she was happy with her recon you put bad tattoos on it now she's not happy anymore so it's really it it just destroys all of their hopes of what they had wanted to happen with that tattoo because they want to have they know it's not the same they know it's never going to be the same again they're not going to be like pre mastectomy condition they know that um but to have all of that like destroyed with the bad tattoo it just crushes like just all of their hopes and and it's it's sad and people don't understand like this work has a huge amount of responsibility with it 
Um, you know, you, you really have, you cannot be cavalier. You cannot have, you cannot go in there like trigger fingers, pulling, you know, bang, bang, let's do this. Like you can't, you have to, you have to be methodical about it and you have to make sure that you're doing the right thing for this person and safely tattoo them, give them a good result and be safe about it. And you can't learn that in two days in a, in a two day class. No way. Yeah. yeah. And I I've been saying lately, like these women are being denied the opportunity for closure during their breast cancer journey because of these bad tattoos. Yeah. And a lot of times, like for in your, in exactly what you said, like you can have a beautiful reconstruction, you know, even the scars look amazing as best mm -hmm. they could. Right. But then you mm -hmm. see this, shh, I don't want to say it very, oh. poorly, very poorly done yeah. tattoo where new scar formation happened yeah. because of bad yeah. technique. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, so there's, there's actual physical damage being done to these women that could have totally been avoided, exactly. you know, totally been avoided. So exactly. So I know we talked a lot about all the bad stuff, uh, but as we are heart-centered types of artists, we always want to find the positive and then the solution. We don't want to stick in the negative. So um, how do you think we can fix these problems and um, how can we help as artists? Um, I think one of the biggest ways that we can help is, well, two, two things, honestly, is to take, um, you know, us artists that have this work in our heart and we've been properly trained and we only want to do good out there in the world. We're not just looking at do dollar signs. People are not dollar signs. You know, you talk about like, oh my gosh, I'm going to make a six figure income. What? No, you either want to do good in the world or you don't like, so now can you make money and do good in the world? Sure. You can, that can't be your priority. You have to care about the human being. There's a human being on the other end of that needle that is depending on you to only do right by them. Um, so I feel like us artists speaking out and kind of cohesively coming together and um, bringing these things into the light, right? And and talking more about it openly. This shouldn't be a dirty little secret in plastic surgery world where we're like, oh, we accept this. This is the gold standard in plastic surgery. This is the medical, you know, this is good enough. No, it's not good enough. And I think when us artists come together and start talking about it, and we start demanding better standards for survivors and we can speak on their behalf, then that's one way to help with the solution. And then the other way is really just to educate the survivors. We got to educate the doctors. We got to tell them like, hey, we don't want to, we're not going to put up with this anymore, right? Like these people deserve better. Um, so we have to have an avenue to educate them. We have to have an avenue to educate the survivors. I think social media is great with that because um, I just know, like I started tattooing in the doctor's office in like 2007 ish, 2008 ish. Um, and back then, like nobody came in the door, thank God with pictures of like, I want this nipple because I wouldn't have been able to draw it. I wouldn't have been able to replicate that. Right. Um, but like now people are so much more educated, like they're taking pre mastectomy photos. They're bringing them into their appointment, like for inspiration, like this is the color I used to have. Um, the, this is the size and shape I was used to for X amount of years of my life. Like, um, and just being able to connect through like Facebook, um, like the deep sea journey, you know, different support groups and stuff. So I think if we talk to people that run these support groups, like Terry, we talk to people, um, who, um, you know, uh, our, our other artists and, and Stacy who has a presence on social media. If we talk, we can get the survivors the education that they need to be able to make a good decision. Because ultimately when they walk through the doctor's office they and they get a bad tattoo or a permanent makeup artist, they get a bad tattoo. It's because they didn't know the right questions to ask. They didn't know what to look for. They didn't know to look for pictures because had they known that they would have done all that groundwork before and avoided ever getting that bad tattoo. So we have to kind of help them like know the process. Yes. I love that. I think information is power for sure. And it definitely starts with the person who's going to get these tattoos, just like they research their surgeons, the hospitals, they, oh. they have these procedures, um, the different types of treatment, you know, diet, you know, um, if they want chemotherapy, radiation, mm -hmm. you know, like, but the tattoo part is like really lacking in the information, but where I know yeah. we're all working on that, thank oh, God yeah. social media for that. Yeah. So with the other artists, um, last question, cause this is round Robin style. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
who would you like to interview next? And so kind of like an open invitation to that. <laughs> yeah, that? I would like to interview Becky, sweet little Becky over in the UK. Oh, yeah. Becky Walker. Yes, <laughs> yeah, she's another uh, hardest, hardest artist. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. She, she would be fantastic. So uh, yeah, okay, Becky, that's a, a call to action for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, Chrissy will be getting in touch with you to to get you down in our round robin uh, podcast interview. That would be awesome. Uh, so yeah, Chrissy, you have so much information and experience and I love your honesty um, from your journey of being a medical tattoo artist. And because I know that takes courage and every artist who starts anywhere, mm-hmm. we always basically suck and don't do our best. Yeah. But that's with everything, but to have that humility and to be honest about it helps other people realize, okay, if she was there and she got better, I can too. So how did she do it? Mm-hmm. Kind of lead the path to the correct yeah. way of doing it and not stay stuck in those right. bad habits like you are. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And it was hard, you know, it was hard to get the courage to walk into the tattoo shop, right? I mean, you yeah. know, I walk in there. I'm this middle-aged white woman. I go in, there's a bunch of young guys, in, you know, and they're all lined up barbershop style and doing their thing. And it's intimidating. Um, but, you know, they were so kind and so welcoming and just such a great group of people. And I still go there, you know, I still go there and, and learn and stuff. So, um, but it, you know, that was scary, but I knew it was going to be worth it because I wanted to learn to do things the right way. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then people will say to me, this is another thing I was wanting to tell you, people will be like, oh my gosh, you have such a gift. I don't have a gift girl. Have, did you see the tattoos I did for 10 years? That is not, if I had a gift, I would have not been cranking out those bad tattoos for 10 years. It's not a gift. I had really good trainers. Um, I worked on, I got to watch and sit and learn. And I, I did fundamental training, um, with a great tattooer here in town and, you know, I trained with TJ Dill. I trained with Stacy, right? Like I've trained with great people and I've put a lot of hard work into it. And that's why, you know, that's why I'm able to, to do what I do every day that I love it. You know, it's not that I have a gift. I'm, I'm not gifted. I just try really hard. Yeah. It's called dedication and passion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for accepting my uh, invitation. <laughs> invitation. Yeah. To be- uh, so I pass on the torch to you and um, yep, definitely reach out to Becky and uh, hopefully we will hear be hearing your interview with her soon. Awesome. I love it. Thank you. Thank My you. Pleasure. Thank you. So thank you everyone for listening and uh, hope you all have a beautiful day and mm-hmm. uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye. <laughs>